here today expecting um, to hear from the Mayor. He's come along to talk to the um, disability community about his plans for Auckland. So a lot of people have submitted questions and we're here to find out what's the future for Auckland for people with disabilities. Auckland and transformation. Now that's really what I want to talk about today. And I think uh, that it's, it's transformation generally. Um, so the country had been tired of us arguing with each other. We, we uh, renowned across the country for two things. One, that we're Jaffas. Uh, that's just another fabulous Aucklander, of course. Uh, and secondly, that we have uh, shown a marked inability to agree on a lot of things and, and to make inconsiderable process on a range of fronts. And so um, the, the government and the country really, against I think our will, a lot of people thought, yeah, super city, good idea, quite like the idea of one set of rules, one set of rates, whatever. But most people were not sure about it. And uh, so the government and the nation said, well, we don't care whether you're sure or not, you're getting super city eyes. And we want your super city eyes because we're sick of your arguing. We want you to have one common vision, one plan, and to really lift the bar in your city because you're our only international city. You're getting bigger than all hell. And we want to make sure that you are driving this nation out into the international marketplace. We want you out there as our flagship bearer, the great city of New Zealand. It became even more important when Christchurch, you know, had its problems. So, we got super cityized. The big expectation from that is we would lift the bar. In other words, we go through some degree of transformation and we'd really get that sense of energy, uh, of endeavour, of entrepreneurship, of clear vision that really founded the city. So, for me, uh, Auckland stars are aligning whether we wanted to or not, whether we wanted them to or not. And uh, I, I look back over the last sort of 60 or 70 years, and I want to use the CRL, which, you know, I'm just so pleased that we've now got the government and, and, and our council joined up together as an example of what is possible when you get joined up, when you get a unity of spirit, when you get a very clear understanding of what it is that you want to achieve, when you have a vision and you're out there looking to deliver on that vision when you've got a people united. And uh, so the uh, decision yesterday, and it'll be formally announced today, about that for me really reflects the fact that Auckland founded on a spirit of energy, of go get them, of, you know, blue sky out there, there's nothing holding us back. That real sense of transformation and growth and of progression um, is now a spirit that's starting to imbue us again. And uh, I, I feel on days like this a real sense of being able to just reach out and feel the future of this place. That we can really deliver a special city here. Now the plan for how we go together as a city over the next 30 years, uh, for example, the vision for inclusivity. An extraordinarily diverse city ours. A diverse city of people and uh, their respective or relative physical needs and statuses of culture, that we are the most multiculturally diverse city in the planet, uh, that we are diverse in the sense that we are all around 5,000 square kilometres of land, so we have diverse geographical interests, that in this place uh, we would have the spirit about us and the sense of tolerance and understanding and preparedness to reach out across our differences that we might create a special, special community as an exemplar to the global community. And within that sense of inclusiveness that we have embedded in the Auckland Plan as one of our primary principles, if not the most important principle, uh, that the community and those that represent the disability sector in particular, and we know that numbers of people, however you define disability, um, sitting at something like, you know, sort of 15 to 20 percent of our community at any one time, uh, that you in particular representing those concerns or being a part of that sector 
uh, would be specifically interested in that sense of transformation, how the city best reflects uh, and encapsulates your concerns as we build this city. Whether it is around transportation, so for example, next month we will have the first electric train on the tracks. They are packing it up in Spain at the moment. Those trains are disability proof trains. We really put a lot of sort of, uh, we put a lot of energy into ensuring that, uh, that the concerns of the disabled community are appropriately represented within the structure of that train. And uh, you know, I mean, this is a step change from where we've been as a city, where we had no interest or no focus at all around the concerns or needs of those who are disabled in our community and how we did transportation, how we planned our city, what we put in our district schemes. I mean, in Manukau in the south, we were reasonably forward when we brought Martin in as our disability advisor. Uh, and you know this is still quite new stuff for uh, for Auckland Council and for the communities around Auckland in terms of how we plan. <coughs> so now it is about sinking within our plans that sense of inclusiveness and to ensure that our rules and our regulations reflect uh, an inclusive approach to those who are uh, suffers from disability or represent disabilities. Now this is not going to happen overnight. Um, you know, I'm, I'm acutely aware of the fact that change in this area, and particularly where you've got a built environment, and I had Dr. Huhana and our disability advisory group taking me down around the bottom end of town the other day, and we went into the PwC building, was it? PwC. Oh man, I mean, that, 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 was, that was such an eye-opener, and I couldn't believe, you know, what a convoluted entrance to that building. And this is a modern building. I was embarrassed. Quite frankly, ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> so we won't be building any more buildings like that. Uh, and so, I mean, to to one get engagement, genuine engagement, get the learnings, understand the challenges, and then ensure that how we build, the structures that we build, the importance of the unitary plan and setting a, a framework around how we build into the future, um, you know, is is such now an important piece of work for us to do and critical in terms of your advocacy either to me, to our councillors, to our planners so that they understand a building Auckland of now and the future, one that we get those disability issues and access issues right. Secondly that our transport planners have exactly the same focus uh, so you know clearly um, the disability advisory group that we've got uh, and then a disability advisory group to Auckland Transport key parts of one, getting engagement, two, opening lines of communication, three, driving change. And uh, so I think we're, in a, we're not in the perfect space, but we're a lot further ahead in terms of our planning and our receptiveness and understanding than where we were five years ago, and we'll be a lot further ahead in five years' time. Uh, so my, my final message to you is the unitary plan we're doing at the moment um, you know, clearly a document that has engendered uh, a lot of fire and a lot of heat but not a lot of common sense at times. Um, this, is a, this is basically a set of rules to help us build the city in a much better way than we've done in the past. And no one can tell me we've made the perfect city to this point. Um, you know, we, we're trying to find a much better balance around our needs and in particular provide for housing choices for all the people in our community. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I've got about a dozen questions. I've probably answered half of them already now. Uh, but but I've, got, I've got about a dozen questions. We can sort of go through those. But um, uh, you know, I hope you get a sense of um, what, what I want to convey to you today, and that's hope. And then secondly, a sense that we are in this all together. And I want to ensure that you don't feel, uh, or any parts of our community feel they're not included in this process of building yeah, a beautiful city. Uh, as a third generation disabled Auckland ratepayer, uh, who, whose family experience of negotiating Auckland's inner CBD area over the past 70 years is full of negative experiences due to an inaccessible mentality shown by previous environmental developers and a refusal by City Council to place access as a key driver, what is the Mayor's vision for increasing access for all visitors to the city and how does he see that the city can better accommodate those who have impairments and are living within the CBD area and who are currently under-resourced 
and whose voice is keen to be heard. And basically, uh, my, my view of the CBD, and particularly having sat down there in the town hall for the last three years, is that my, uh, my grieving for the loss of our CBD uh, and its uh, sense of being the heart and soul of our city, the hub, and that we lost that over the last 50 or 60 years as we built our suburbs and, and our malls around the place, um, you know, that, that that is palpable. And so the first thing is I want our CBD to be very much returned to us as Aucklanders as the heart and soul of our place, where we meet and greet. So that's the first thing. I want it to be accessible and a place that welcomes everybody in the whole city. Secondly, uh, there are, uh, what I'd really like to do with Queen Street and Key Street, when you're talking about accessible, I mean, Clearly we have uh, issues relating to mobility up and down of our, um, our footpaths and our crossings. Uh, we are making some progress in the work that's been done there, but sometimes we go backwards to go forwards. Uh, I was uh, down by Britomart there, and they've done a really nice uh, arrangement of cobbling on the roads, which was supposed to be a sort of a, a shared space arrangement. And what that did was prove to be an obstacle course for those in mobility chairs and or with canes. It was a disaster. So we basically had to get rid of the nice cobbling um, and sort of smooth the surface out to make it much more accessible for those um, you know, who were challenged. So uh, we, uh, we are definitely looking to make uh, the issue of transition of footpath to road to footpath as you're going across the many crossings up and down Queen Street um, much, much better uh, and uh, comfortable for uh, those with accessibility issues. Second issue that I'd like to say, and uh, we've got the Mayor of Brisbane here at the moment, uh, Lord Mayor, uh, they call them the Lord Mayor over there, uh, Lord Mayor uh, Graham Quirk, and, and Quirk is a, a really neat bloke, and he, uh, uh, we were talking last night about the fact that in Brisbane, their main street is Queen Street too and they converted it to a, pende a pedestrian boulevard. They got the cars out of it, the bus out of it, everything out of it, they put the buses under it, and then they basically just open it up to walkability, and it's a fabulous, fabulously accessible place that attracts 26 million people in that street per annum, three times more than what they used to before they got the cars and everyone else out of it. So um, one of the things for our CBD area is that, and you see this in uh, Elliott Street, sorry mate, uh, you see this in uh, Elliott Street, Fort Street, you know, Fort Street down there now is to basically make it the preserve of um, pedestrians and for us, uh, no matter what our status is, whether we're in a chair, out of a chair or whatever, that this be a place where we can just hang out and we're not constantly um, the subject to looking out for traffic. You know, so those shared spaces I think would be great for everybody in the community and would make uh, our CBD experience much, much more accessible. Uh, thirdly, I guess you, you, you're talking also about buildings. Well, I've reflected on uh, PwC and how you go from uh, the footpath environment uh, in and out of buildings. Um, I mean, we, we need to basically take that uh, PwC. I'm sure that our rules are better now than what they were then, and that would have been about 15 years ago. Never. Well, there's no way that you could do that. That's my question. Well, well, <laughs> well uh, yeah, so, so we'll, we'll get there, but, but the, the fact that it was a con, quite frankly, um, you know, that, that the issue of um, appropriate um, you know, disability access in and out of our main buildings, in particular our commercial buildings and our retail buildings, needs to be the first part of any um, you know, sort of uh, inquiry as to whether or not an application should succeed. And so that, that uh, point of ensuring that disability issues are writ large into our new unitary plan um, is very much at front and centre for the Disability Advisory Group and for the engagement in the unitary plan. We've had a lot of feedback from the disabled sector around building and how we construct uh, commercial buildings and public buildings in particular to be more um, you know, disability friendly. Another question. Uh, yeah. uh, with the increased cruise line industry sector yes. and the intention to grow their stay within the Auckland port for as long as possible, mm. does the Mayor see the need to introduce a mobility centre concept to the inner public city transportation system, i.e. the Britomart uh, zone, uh, to better mobilise all visitors throughout the greater city region, including the Waiheke Island and beyond? And would he consider a partnership model with this proposal with a community-based organisation such as ILS? <laughs> 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 
What? So I'm going to. Sometimes I'm sort of thinking laterally to get back to the first question. So the lateral thinking here is we've just concluded a tenders and procurement strategy. Uh, when we started out as a, as a super city council, we sort of had to get a lot of stuff in place really fast uh, on the basis that we're going to come back and sort of backfill a bit. You know, but we just had to get things moved, as you can imagine. It was just huge. So uh, the, the tenders and procurement strategy was about, uh, right, lowest price, just go. Uh, we've come back to it again and have concluded it in a way that suggests that for some of our contracting and tendering, we are looking to community partnerships. Now we have recognised our ability to engage that type of great community trust organisation to deliver some of our community and environmental services. And so I would expect that an organisation like this, uh, where we were looking to, uh, for example, engage properly in the tourism sector, and you're right, I mean, Auckland, Destination Auckland is a big part of economic development strategy, and man, it's going off. The cruise, I mean, we've, we've nearly doubled the number of cruise ships coming here over the last three years. We are now the number one cruise destination globally, according to some of the travel mags. And it's, I mean, that's incredible. That's off nothing. And we didn't even have a cruise ship terminal. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we now have sheds in. You've got to check it out. Two months' time, it's, it's all been open. Uh, uh, but, and, and what's more, we haven't had a very good joint upness of our tourism industry, but now we are really focused. And to have, for example, I mean, you talk about uh, a mobility centre, well, I mean, you know, that's a possibility. Let, let's just scope that out and think about what that means. But to have yourselves as a part of the welcome, somehow or other connected down there in the cruise terminal, maybe that's even a much better idea. You know, that you're right there at the coalface. This city's accessibility, um, you know, sort of uh, sensitive. And we are here uh, as a part of the welcoming crew. <coughs> um, Brisbane have greeters. And if you've ever been to Brisbane, I mean, these are, these are red shirted characters who've got greeters on it. And they go around and take visitors to Brisbane to all, you know, the, the key places. And, um, you know, th this, this uh, you know, the disability sector would be brilliant in amongst that. You know, love their city, understand it and um, you know, it could provide a unique perspective to our city. And through that perspective, continue to feed back to us that um, you know, disability sector travelling as much as everyone, for God's sake, make sure our city is welcoming of those tourists coming in who are disabled or otherwise, but give that perspective. So uh, you know, I like the idea, I uh, need to scope it out. Um, the disability accept, uh, advisory group would be a, a good place to make sure that's coming through from Dr Who and all the team. Uh, and uh, you know, let's start that discussion. But uh, I think I think this has got some got some good wheels to it. Great. So our next question is from Vivian. If I could just lead on from <coughs> excuse me, what Tony was saying. Um, in the UK, there is a mobility <coughs> service in pretty well all the most major and provincial centres, um, where there's signage if you drive into those centres, and they tell you where it is, and there's good parking. Yeah. And um, I, I've actually used it a few times when I've been in the UK, particularly in York. Can you describe it, Vivian? Describe it to me. What, you know, well, what, it what is, does it look like, and how does it operate? What it is, what, what I did in, in York, because it's got all those cobbles, and wheelchairs and cobbles don't mix. No, that's right. <laughs> no, I'm sure, I saw that. And I was able to use a power wheelchair, so you simply park your car, so that's like collateral, if you like, because you're not going to run off with a, um, a, a, a scooter or, or a power chair um, because you're leaving your car behind, and presumably that's worth a lot more. Mm. And um, so, so it's a case of mobility, but not always. <laughs> but well, with all the hand controls and everything else, it probably is. <laughs> um, so that you're, you're, you, you've got the opportunity. It's like, it's like a higher place of different types of equipment yeah. that people can use. It even includes having um, a, a rain, rain gear if you've arrived and you need a cape over your, um, over your chair wow. and, and cushions. I mean, I can send you information as to what happens in the UK, if you like. But it would be 
So the logical space is downtown, isn't it? The logical place is yeah. downtown. Should be a nice um, side or something like that. And it's um, the topography of this city is difficult yeah. for anybody with mobility impairment. So we're talking about older people, people who are walking, and so on and so forth. So to have that down the bottom of town, plus the fact that we've got much and more shared space, which means that people can't rely on parking and getting close to their destination. Yeah. And older people are using scooters a lot more, and there will be more scooters. We are a population that is ageing yeah. significantly. We've got dual bumps. We've got a big bump at the front end with a lot of births and a back end, you know, with, with people actually getting older significantly um, in a, in a, over a generation. Yeah. So you're right about that. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I really would, in, would endorse what, what Tony is saying there. Um, because it's an embarrassment, to be honest, when people are coming off their cruise ships and we've yeah. got one hop-on, hop-off bus that's actually got low floor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ensure that Chief Executive Officer of Arteed and Waterfront Auckland, John Dalziel, I will pass on to them uh, this issue. Who should they be talking to? Um, could I just say we've, we've spoken to them, they're aware of this. Oh good, okay, now I'm going to speak to them. <laughs> so are they we engaging? We Well, slightly, we're doing round slightly. the Slightly? Slightly could mean a lot of things. So the issue, I guess, that we have is that when people are really very well taken care of on the cruise ships, fabulous yeah, that's right. equipment, as soon as they get outside Shed 10, yeah. they're on their own. Yeah. So now we've got Shed 10, we've actually got to get an experience where people can feel that they are being directed out onto uh, the downtown area and community. So there's, you know, it's just not an accessibility issue. It's a welcome issue, for a start. And so, uh, but having on the, the the good thing about it is because we're at the front end of this, you know, it's critical for you to be right in the middle of that discussion now, so that the possibility of a mobility centre, uh, you know, dealing with all issues of access is right there in either Shed 10 or out on one of our sites, right at the wolf front. Okay, so if you are having a slight engagement at this point in time. It's around the houses. Yeah, well, we don't do around the houses. So um, just note from me to John and uh, Brett, get serious. All right. I think we need to talk about it. Oh, no, well, that's, don't worry, it'll go out there after we have this meeting. You talk about the introduction to the city too. I wouldn't look too far away from Auckland Airport. Auckland Airport actually is one of the best Good. welcomes anywhere in the world. Excellent. I was just wondering if you're employed with... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that's, that is the other extreme. And although, we, you know, I'm sort of saying to them, look, it's still a bit sort of, you know, universal, you know, what, what city have arrived in. So they're getting a better look uh, around the place now. Um, but they weren't connecting them well with our eyesight guys out there. They were saying to them, don't go out and approach the passengers as they're coming off there because you, you, you might be seen as trying to sell something. Well, they sure are. They're selling Auckland and New Zealand. So, um, so again, they, they, they're now much more joined up. And uh, uh, so are you in discussions with um, Adrian at AIAL? Um, that's our phase two. Phase, we'll, we'll make it phase one, part of phase one. Because, you know, I, I'm saying to the guys at the airport and the seaport, you, you're part of the same thing here. This is a totally joined up thing. They're either coming in the front door or the front door. You're both the front door. Mm. And so let's have a complete, um, in, con, a connected in strategy uh, where, where we are selling exactly the same message and providing the same services. Yeah. Would Auckland Council be okay. prepared to lead the country on adopting better design principles for not just council-owned buildings? The current building code is minimal. It's not been updated since its inception in 92, and, and the, uh, uh, um, including the acceptable solutions in that. The government has no appetite to amend it, despite the, uh, the fact that the Department of Building and Housing, as it was, did start the process of updating the building code, and they did that in the mid-2000s, um, and I say it's just fallen apart since then. Um, we, otherwise, we're going to continue to build buildings that are not inclusive, yeah. because developers, particularly developers, want to go for the minimum. Do I have to do that? And if the, the um, designer says, well, no, not really, knock it out, that's it. That's all there is to it. Um, so this is obviously isn't conducive to, to the future population as, as it ages. 
um, apart from the, the population now. So that when we've gone to the Price Waterhouse Coopers building, that building is code compliant. And that's our problem. The telecom building in uh, Victoria Street West is code compliant. The so fact what's the problem with that one? Explain to me the, the issue here. Well, the telecom building, they, they designated the, the so-called accessible entrance was on Victoria Street West. This well, you've got, to be, green, uh, you've got to be a mountain green. goat to get up Victoria Street West. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so when you don't make your entrances inclusive, and you've been using the word inclusive right from the start, yeah. we've got to know what that really means. And it's not a case that, well, some people are going to take another entrance, mm -hmm. when in fact this is the designated entrance, as seen as the main entrance. So where is Coopers building? Queen Street is their main entrance, it's their address, 188. Okay, if you're having a pram, you don't like escalators, you can't climb stairs, you've got to go around Albert Street to get in through that route. But as I say, that is code compliant, and that's because the code says at least one route must be accessible. We want that turned on its head so that every route is accessible, and the designer has to demonstrate why that can't be achieved. The topography might be wrong, the way the building is, is orientated might be wrong, but at least we're coming from the top-down approach rather than this yeah. constant minimalisation the whole time. So we can advocate, firstly, uh, with you and work on that issue. Right? Secondly, yes. uh, getting back to the unitary plan and that sense of, <laughs> of one set of rules across the whole of the region. Uh, which I think is one of the great benefits of the United Auckland Council. What I um, am encouraging you to do, and I know you are, and certainly our advisory uh, group is right in the heart of this, is in the middle of the discussions around the unitary plan and what we can do uh, to encourage a uniformity of approach around the issues of access to new commercial buildings. It's, I mean, public buildings, Schmalton, so what? I mean, it should be all buildings. So, um, but uh, what I would really appreciate uh, is, um, is actually understanding, so I need to understand it from all angles, so I need to be hearing also from uh, the, you know, so you say the rules should represent um, the optimum position and then the sector should say back, well, why shouldn't I do it or why can't I do it? Um, I, I would, um, r I really want to see, and this is what we've done with the community and unitary plans, just go in there and say, look, here's some ideas, what do you think? and let's build this thing up together. It's exactly the same for yourselves in the disability sector and the construction sector. I don't want you standing off each other at 40 metres. I, I, I want that discussion face to face. I want to understand what the problems are in construction, either dealing with an existing building and or new buildings, and why we can't sort it out in the rules going forward. So I think, you know, I, I, you know I, what I'd like to see um, is 40 of you and 40 of, of the construction industry guys working it out. You know, coming up with a set of rules that, one set of rules, a lot better than what we've got at the moment, they'll actually, um, you know, deliver a much more accessible building platform into the years ahead. I feel it's also a, a, an economic um, argument. Oh, of course well. it is. It's massive. And, and, and that's the part that we can't prove. Yeah. Because we can't say that these businesses have lost out on customers yeah. because they couldn't readily get there. If you can't get to somewhere easily, yeah. you don't bother. You go somewhere. Okay, so I'm thinking of that PwC building. You go in there and you want to take a lift. You've got to go around the back to the other entrance in your wheelchair or by walking around or whatever, and you get to the lift and up you go. I'm looking at that front entrance and I'm thinking, Crikey, why shouldn't we all just go in there? I mean, it must have cost them an arm and leg to put the escalator in there anyhow. Well, why not just put a lift in there? Yeah. And, and if you want to make it aesthetically beautiful, <laughs> then make it an open glass, you know, enshrouded lift that, you know, anyone can get into. And I think that would be a much better entrance into that place than sort of an escalator that makes it look like an airport. But you can't force it. And yeah. because the regulatory team, all they want to do is tick boxes yeah. that it complies. And they can't force anything. And the same thing happened. Have a look at the telecom building. Mm. There was easy No, I've been in there once and I it just didn't... Mm. Well, there was easily room. That's a 12-metre staircase. Yeah. And there was easily room for a nice, aesthetically pleasing lift that would have fitted in with the, the whole design. Manson's built that. Yeah. They didn't want to put a lift in because it would have cost them another 100000 Yeah. Yet yeah, that building sold for around about $230 million. It's an attitude thing. Yeah. And all the time we've got this attitude to fight against with developers.
Do you know, when, when you're in the middle of a, of, a, of, a, of a hugely important process of bringing the community together to agree a vision and a, and a plan forward for a city as it goes through transformation and as it grows, this is the time where the designers and the architects need to be right in the middle of the debate and driving it. If anyone's giving you that, that you know, I just don't accept that. I, I want to see them very active. Because of all the unitary plan feedback on design, next Tuesday, the 2nd of July, from 4 to 7, there is actually going to be an externally facilitated but council-hosted more in-depth session where there will be uh, council officers, where there will be disability and access sector and community, as well as architects and developers, to talk about these, uh, these, these principles around what is universal design, about these principles that uh, Vivian and Tom <coughs> has been talking about. So that is a direct f flow on from people who did provide input into the draft unity plan, that there is now going to be a further sit down around that. So we've got um, uh, some pretty intense discussion forums over the next month or so. Uh, we, are, we are looking for, okay, so here's the first cut. Um, here's some of the feedback we've had. Man, we've got a lot. Uh, and um, and so uh, let's bring uh, you know some of the most um, vociferous uh, and or interested and or representative groups in, have further discussion. You know, this is where we're getting to. So I, I thank you, Martine. I think that would be well worth your while. But um, having said that, you know, that's a generic discussion. I think it is critical for you to be engaged in a more intensive way. Mm -hmm. All right? And so Martine, I'm sure, will, will help that to happen. Yeah. And we, we will give her and uh, the disability team at council support to make sure that that's happening. We've talked about the unitary plan. Yep. You've used the word affordable throughout that. Yes. Can we ask you what that actually means? Because I'm hearing that we're looking at three and four storey apartment blocks where there will be no lift. Okay. Well, I don't think anyone's going to successfully define affordable. My view of affordable housing is, and, and it's sort of borders on the issue of social housing, uh, is that I'm particularly interested in the range of pricing from about 200,000 for your single studio flats and apartments up to about 500, 550,000, which is the upper end housing in, in, for example, Hobsonville. Your new terrace, two, three bedroom terraced housing in Hobsonville as the best example of the range. Now, some of it's, well, a good part of it's standalone housing, so it's all your housing choices, whether or not it's an apartment house, a flat, courthouse, duplex, whatever, and or, um, you know, standalone home. So, that's what I see as affordable in terms of the housing accord with the government. We want to get a lot of pace over the next three years uh, and or in terms of what we're trying to achieve through the unitary plan through opening up both greenfields and brownfields housing opportunities. So we're encouraging people to enable them to build a one or two bedroom house um, in, be in behind their property and or secondly what the government's doing with their um, housing New Zealand package is saying we'll add on bedrooms an extra bedroom or two, depending on your housing needs, you know, to sort of cut your costs. So, uh, now, the idea of building above uh, two storeys, three, four, five, without a lift, that's, I haven't had to internalise what that means. Okay, so I, so I need to get up to speed on that particular issue. Um, on, a, on a private house, uh, it, it could be a struggle. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's going to be there's going to be increasing three, four, five bedroom homes built, and there are now. Yeah, but people will increasingly do that. And yeah, well, yeah, okay, okay. So if it's a if it's, if it's a, a commercial apartment, well, even if it's strata titled, um, I'm going to have to get my head around that one. Uh, my, my sentiment would be if it's an apartment, and certainly if it's an apartment block, and you've got sort of a block of 10, 15, 20, 25 apartments. Let's say the guy who um, Ockram Building who are our best um, low-level apartment builders. Let's say he was here, and I might get him in here for a discussion. I think he'd probably put a lift in, because he would see it as a state of the art. He'd see it as best practice, and he would see it as opening up his market to the whole community. Mm. All right? So it's a selling point, yeah. not a constrictor. And so the, it would add to the value of his apartments, because 
It's just not about anyone who's in a wheelchair, it's about, you know, anyone full stop. If we can get developers in who understand the economic benefits, not just the community benefits, of doing something like that, we might be able to get an, an agreed a consensus. Right. All right? Council, then, isn't it? right yes. Oh, absolutely it is. <laughs> Abs absolutely it is. And, you know, so that's, that's the discussion we'll be having over the next year through before notification of the unitary plan and even after it. People say, oh, God, you're going to notify the unitary plan and there'll be no more discussion. God, ye of little faith. <laughs> Man, you know, the, I, I, I don't know what was going on in councils around the city because my style has always been about the fact that this is an iterative process right until we adopt this thing. And I want the community to be involved in the discussion. I don't want the lawyers all over this. You know, man, I mean, I'm a lawyer. And, you know, that, that, that's the last port of call. You know, we've got to be able to work this stuff out as a community going forward. We'll make decisions. But I want to see you guys in and around that right up to it. Okay? Like a minimum quota or also we can just build as far as the apartments that are a minimum of 20% have to be fully accessible. So therefore, yep. if they're building a, a three story apartment with 10, 10 uh, units in, then mm. the bottom, you know, on the bottom floor, at least two of them have to be fully accessible. The smarter idea might be that they all are. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about <coughs> the primary, if, if, if you're talking about the primary issue being one entrance, so accessibility off wherever it is you're coming, whether it's out of a car park, a bus stop, a footpath or whatever. So the first issue is getting in and being you know, comfortable and having a good transition in off uh, the public thoroughfare. And then secondly, getting up. Well, you know, you might as well, if you're going to have a lift, you've got a lift. You know, and if you've got three, four, five, six, seven storeys, well, you might as well lifted the whole lot. And it also um, gives uh, people who need the access yep. um, a choice of where they live. They're not um, yep. limited to ground floor only. Okay, now I'm going to go back to my dad. Accessible. My dad has become um, the soup du jour in terms of my examples to the community. Dad turned 87 and all of a sudden major issues around health. And, um, and so we had to do with dad what I warned him 70 years ago we we're going to have to do and that's take him out of home and get him into a retirement village where he didn't have a choice, we had to make it for him. And uh, so now he's in there. Uh, but that retirement home is a five storey apartment block. He's on the top. It's a great one bedroom apartment. He's grinning his ears off. He said, I should have done this seven years ago, Lee. <laughs> and I'm saying, that's right. Now, these retirement villages, they are being set up left, right and centre. The, the fastest growing part of our property, segment, property market at the moment are retirement villages. We've got applications coming out of our ears. It's great. We need them. Because it's a critical choice for the elderly as you go into your senior years. Low maintenance, plenty of uh, friends, colleagues and others around the place, an entertaining lifestyle and great opportunities just to hang out and relax in your senior years. And the ones that are the most popular are certainly multi-level and man, they got to have lifts and they got to be totally accessible and the more accessible and uh, better free, um, utilised they are around lift uh, functionality, which is all, this is access, 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 access uh, and efficiency in access, the, the better they sell. And of course, it's, you know, these are all primarily, you know, uh, licence costs and, uh, and, and you know, so the, the better provision they are for accessibility, the better they do. You realise that Somerset is the only retirement village that has really embraced lifetime design. Mm. Remember, it's all built on a business model. Yeah, no, we're trying to get them going out there at Monterey Point. So the business model is they like their people to be moving out every seven years because that's where they make their money. Right. What happens to people, the ones who can move in are the ones who've got property to sell. Yeah. What happens when they run out of money? Where are they going to go? Okay, I've got a story. Now, um, it's, a, it's rate payers tell me, Lynn, we're not in the business of doing where the government is or the private sector is. I totally accept that and agree that. There was, in the 60s and 70s, a very strong push by councils to become involved in council housing. And in particular, housing for the elderly, because the Labor government in 72, 75 really opened up the opportunity 
of councils building housing for the elderly. And so in Auckland, we went into that big time. Now, of course, the Auckland City Council under Banksy sold and transferred off a number of units, but all the rest of the councils have maintained their housing for the elderly villages, including out the west where they have Wilshire Village. And we have 68, you and I as right payers of Auckland own 68 housing for the elderly villages. Uh, housing about 1,500 units in there. Uh, and uh, so the, the tenants are all paying exactly the same rate as a housing New Zealand tenant would pay for that type of facility. So it's about 25% of your, of your net income goes on paying rental into those. We could probably add, not probably, I know we can, add three to 4,000 new units on all of the land of those villages that should be utilised ideally for elderly and those who are struggling to actually get into retirement homes. So that is the big niche in the market that the market will not fill. It's around the area of affordable housing again. This is not housing to buy, this is housing to rent and for elderly. And so um, I'm, I'm going to ask the ratepayers to allow us to back a deal with someone like Housing Foundation or Salvation Army uh, or Monte Cecilia or Habitat for Housing or the whole lot of them. We've basically got them in the room and saying we've got to do this. We've got to take our land, the potential to utilise that land, put housing for the elderly units on there. Um, you know, now of course it would be a cross subsidy from government, but that happens anyhow. So it might as well go into that sort of thing rather than anywhere else. And we want to try and get three or 4,000 new units on there over the next sort of 10 years. So I think there presents an excellent opportunity that you guys could be all over, um, even beside a partnership, where we put the land in. You and I as a ratepayers put the land in. Well, I mean, the land's there already, isn't it going anyway? So we, we put the land in, that's our contribution. That would help totally justify a business case, even for you know, a housing foundation. Uh, we put it in, they develop it, uh, we maintain our housing stock on there at some of the same terms, and they maintain their housing stock, rent the stuff out at the same price uh, to uh, those who are, who are stretched financially in the older sector, and potentially add three or 4,000 units to the market. What do you reckon? Sound like a reasonable deal? Well, it doesn't cost the ratepayers anything, except we lose our opportunity cost on the land, but put it. Isn't this a pretty good sort of social benefit? I better go. I have a lot of time for, for Len Brown. He's, um, he's got a commitment and he's got a generous heart. Um, so that what he was saying today didn't surprise me. It's really a case of translating because of course it's all generic stuff that he's talking about and it's how we can actually engage the right people within council that um, are going to make the difference. I was encouraged. Uh, obviously uh, the proof of the pudding's in the eating so uh, yeah we need to see a bit more from council going forward and I certainly hope that uh, that the mayor is able to as you say you know bang a few heads, eat a few drums. I also like what he brought up about getting the different groups around the table having the conversation so there's the voice of the disability community um, there's the developers and having us all talk about what the issues are and then looking at how we can move forward and make uh, accommodation more accessible, more inclusive for not only the disability community but all of our community and that, um, that makes sense, having those conversations instead of each, you know, doing the grumbles in our own sectors and wondering why people aren't listening is um, getting that, having that conversation so it could be another topic for Expresso Chat. He's very committed and I think it's up to us as our sector to push it forward and make things um, happen and change. So I feel very positive about it.